I invite you to take your Bible with me and uh, turn to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. That's where we are this morning. Our preaching text, the whole chapter. It's not too long. I know I've avoided reading uh, long sections of, of Scripture, but this one I think we can handle. If you uh, follow along in your open Bible, um, we'll, we'll get to the Word. Don't remember the page number in the church Bible? Somewhere near the beginning of your Bible. 28 chapters in. All right, let's give our full attention to the reading of the Word of God. <clears throat> Chapter 28, then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may t take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there, and that, he, that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Paddan Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep, and he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And, all, and of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. This is God's word. I invite you to join me in, in praying. We need the Lord's help. Father, you have spoken. This is your word, and it is authoritative. It is true, and while it is not about us, it is for us and to be applied to us. And I pray, Father, that by your Spirit in this room this morning, in this time, that you would grant me utterance, controlled by your Spirit, that we would give proper illumination to this word, that it be preached rightly, and that you would work in our hearts something that no mere man can accomplish, that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds with your word, with your truth. So our prayer, Father, is that you would meet us now, speak to us. Your servants are listening. 
may your will be done. Here, now. And may Christ himself be exalted in this place. We ask it in his name. Amen. Uh, in my, uh, my early uh, years of pastoral ministry here, I took some heat from church members. None of them are here that, that gave me this heat, but they would say, uh, they would be annoyed with me that I would, uh, they would say I'd questioned people's faith. And for them, I know it, it was personal because they had adult children who had who'd grown up in the church. They had professed faith in Christ and had been baptized, but were now living essentially unchristian lives. And I think for them, it was probably a misunderstanding of the nat nature of, of genuine faith. They were, they were trusting that the mere profession of faith and baptism, that those, those external activities were, were dif decisive in the salvation of their children. And for them, my preaching called that into question. But I think we've all seen it, haven't we? You can have two people exposed to the very same truth and experience the same opportunities, and yet one believes and endures in faith and the other does not. And it's not the truth of the message that's the difference, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit. I think we get that. Now, moving through Genesis, we've in encountered contrasting archetypes like Cain, Abel, Isaac, Ishmael. And now before us, we have Jacob and Esau. Now, I don't want to diminish the vital importance of understanding God's sovereign choice as a prior reality, but in contrast to Esau, Jacob's life illustrates what it looks like to embrace God's promise. Now, up to this point, we haven't seen that. As we've tracked with Abraham, Abraham owned the promise. Isaac owned the promise, but, but Jacob to this point has seemed rather passive. His father calls him in to bless him. He connives his way into getting the birthright out of his brother Esau. He gets blessed under deception. So Jacob seems, we're not sure, we're not really sure the state of his heart. But what certainly needs to happen is he has to come and embrace the very promise that the Lord has given and make it his own. Now, As we move through this chapter, I, for me, it just broke easily into three sections. And I've chosen really three words as, as headings under which I want to organize some thoughts and, and Trust that the Spirit will help make some application for, li for our lives as, as the people of God today under the new covenant. And so I'm just going to give you those words up front and we'll see where we're headed. Uh, all D words, here we go. Direction, dream, and decision. That's, those are my three headings and we'll, we'll gather it together under those, uh, under those headings. First of all, as we uh, look at verses 1 through 5, the word direction comes to mind. Now, if I want to go to Texas, and this is very obvious to all of us, it matters that I travel south from here and not north, right? Very clear to all of us. The right path is a direction. Now, if I was unfamiliar with geography, I would need someone to tell me, to direct me that I need to travel south. So as you can see, the word direction can be used to describe both a command as well as a path to a destination. And both senses of that word, though related, they're, they're here, and I see both in, in verses 1 through 5. And I'll remind you what the text says. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him. And here's the direction. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise and go to Paddan Aram. A direction on the map. Go to Paddan Aram to the house of Bethul your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So, first, Isaac directed Jacob. He gave him a moral imperative. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite, Canaanite women. Now, there was a very good reason for that command. No doubt, living there in Canaan, in that area, no doubt they had observed Canaanite culture with its idolatry and its uh, debased moral practices. I'm sure they had observed that, weren't strangers to that. And, and I don't doubt that they remembered the story of God's judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Canaanite cities, for their own evil practices. And that was fairly recent history. And of course, Isaac learned from his father Abraham, who heard it from 
Terah, his own father, Abraham's father, going all the way back to his forefather Shem, the son of Noah, that the Canaanites were cursed by God. I'll remind you what it says in Genesis chapter 9. Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. The Lord back then made a clear distinction between the Canaanites. So it was reasonable and obvious. Do not get a wife from these people. But to obey his father's directive, Jacob needed to know where to go and to whom to go. And he was told to go to Paddan Aram. That's the region to the, to the north and, and east of the Jordan River. That's the location where the city of Haran is situated. Haran is that place from which the Lord first called Abraham. So this is where his kin lives, Abraham's kin. So he was instructed specifically, go, go to where his wife's father, Bethuel, and brother Laban live. And like, like I said, they are relatives of Abraham. And what we can assume or presume out of that is that because they were Abraham's relative, they shared a faith in the true and living God, Yahweh. Get a wife from people who acknowledge the Lord, not from these pagans around us. Now, you know, reading the text, we, we get that that moral directive and that path to obeying that directive given from Isaac to Jacob. We see that was, that was from Isaac, but that, that directive was very much for the purpose of ensuring God's blessing. And so could, we could really say that it was the Lord's directive, ultimately. And we see this in the way that, the, that Isaac presents it to Jacob. Verse 3, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. That blessing followed on getting a wife from, from the relatives. That God Almighty may bless you. So in a sense here, Isaac is confirming the blessing of Abraham as it was conferred to him. And now he's saying, Jacob, this is for you too. But like I said, I, I, I think in a sense, doing this, obeying his father, was really a condition for receiving the blessing. Verse 4, may he give the blessing of Abraham to you and your offspring with you, that, that you may take possession of the land of your sojourning that God gave to Abraham. That. And condition. So, so the implication here is that the offspring, any offspring through an illegitimate marriage to a Canaanite wife might indeed threaten that blessing of ultimately possessing the land. Of course, in the sovereign purposes of God, it didn't happen that way and it couldn't happen that way. But this is how Isaac sees it. And this is how Jacob is to understand it. Jacob's obedience to his father Isaac, but really as I said, more importantly, of, of the Lord's blessing. It proved that Jacob embraced that promise. And that promise mattered to Jacob. So he obeyed. And it was very convenient for him to say, well, why, why, why do I need to go to Bethuel? Why do I need to go to Laban? There's fine women around here. But it's clear in Jacob's mind that he, that he understood something about the necessity of obeying his father and ultimately obeying the Lord's command and finding a wife, finding a wife among the relatives. You see, there is a vital connection between faith in the promises of God and obedience to the commands of God. Don't miss that. There's a vital connection between faith in the promises of God and obedience to to the commands of God. Now, I'm not suggesting that obedience is a prior condition to the promises, but having embraced the promise, commands became vitally important. Don't miss that truth. Now, I mentioned that Jacob is an archetype. Contrasted with Esau. Look at Esau in comparison. Verse 8, when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not Please, Isaac, his father. Well, we already knew this back in uh, 26. We were told there, uh, 2635, that these Hittite women, Canaanites, they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. 
<laughs> in fact, uh, ver chapter 27, verse 46, just before uh, uh, the, the section we read, Rebecca, on reflecting about Esau's wives, Rebecca said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. Life had been made bitter. And why that was, likely to me, is just their immoral practices and their behavior seemed to be so such an assault on their moral sensibilities, denying the God who made them. Well, what did Esau do? He figures, I, I think he's now conniving in his own way. I think he figures he can get in on the spoil of his father's blessing because he sees what happened to Jacob. Well, he sees Jacob going off to Paddan Aram. Find a wife among the relatives. Esau thinks, okay, I think I can work something out here. So what does he do? Verse 9, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. Now, the text doesn't give us any direct moral judgment of Esau's marriage decision to now an Ishmaelite. And yes, Ishmael was Abraham's son. But Ishmael indeed was the rejected son. He was not the son of the promise. The implication should not be missed. That was not God's choice. That was not where they'd find righteousness. So Esau's effort was, you know, you might say half obedience at best. And maybe what he did was comfort himself with the idea, well, the Ishmaelites, they're not as bad as the Canaanites. But I think it, for, for Esau, it was more like a negotiating tactic, and, and it was empty. It was empty. Because I, I take it that he only wanted his father's wealth, and he had little regard for the Lord. He wanted the blessings of the promise without treasuring the promise itself. Now, you who profess to be Christian, if you have embraced the promise of forgiveness of your sins in Christ, it's going to show up in your obedience to the whole Word of God. Now, here, I'm not talking about perfection. Don't, don't misread, don't misunderstand. But the direction of your life is toward obedience because you treasure all that God has said. And so when you sin, you know it. You come under conviction and, and you confess and, and repent. And you hate your sin that remains, not, not just because you feel ashamed for it before men, but because God hates it. You know the difference, right? There's a hate of your own sin because you feel ashamed that you've been caught in a sin. But there's a kind of an internal hatred for our sin that comes from valuing what God thinks about it, even if not another soul knows And if the promises of God truly matter to you, if you've embraced, truly embraced by faith, forgiveness in Christ, you want to be holy as God is holy. You want to imitate the, the character of God because you know you're a dearly loved child. So you seek to know God and his word and you seek to live by it. And when you're rebuked by the word of God, you bend to it. And when you're affirmed by the word of God, you thank God. You don't posture yourself. You, you thank God for his grace and guidance. See the difference? Jacob received direction from the Lord. And he physically moved in that direction. Esau, by contrast, saw the blessing and thought he could negotiate something for it. A trade. But he proved he was a fraud. So, are you like Jacob? <laughs> are you like Jacob? Or Esau. Now, there are a lot of religious people who are like Esau. They, they want the benefits of the family of God. They want the promise eternal, of eternal life on their own terms. They love the idea of forgiveness of sins, but only really as a removal of eternal punishment, but not deliverance from the present power of sin. Right? Think about that. Yeah, God, I'll take the forgiveness, but they just want eternal absolution and really freedom to kind of continue to sin. They don't, want, they don't want freedom from sin. They want that to be on their own terms. The Apostle Paul warned Timothy about such people. L listen to what he says, and he's instructing a young pastor 
Paul in 2 Timothy. He says this, but understand this in the last days. Well, I think it's always the last days because I don't think this, this is never not true. But here, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. That's an intentional pause. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now what comes next in this list is absolutely shocking. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. All of those things presumably are sins of the heart that, that apparently aren't recognized. But it's defining for this individual who, who seems to have this appearance of being godly. But all this corruption is within and they effectively deny the power of the gospel. Incredible. That's the same kind of people that, that Jesus issued this rebuke to in the form of a, a question. Luke 6, 46. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Well, it's a rhetorical question. You say Lord, but you don't really mean it. Brothers and sisters, I, I hope you know this. Obedience is a matter of the heart. It's not merely external. And if you embrace the promises of God, it's going to show in the direction of your life. Well, second, the word dream, dream. Famously, MLK had a dream, a very powerful and inspiring vision of this nation. And some among us, I'm sure, have had dreams for, for a ministry opportunity or a family plan or a significant project or an opportunity. But dreams like this, as significant as they may be or personal, dreams like this are of our own making. They are preferred longings of the future, right? And those preferred longings inform present decisions and actions. It's a dream. Now, in our text, Jacob's dream was different because it was not of his own imagining, right? Rather, what happened is that the Lord invaded his sleep to reward his faith. And for Jacob, that resulted in assurance, it resulted in comfort and a profound sense of awe. Assurance, comfort, and awe as a result of the Lord invading his sleep with the dream. Verse, tells, verse 10 tells us, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he obeyed his father's command, is now tra uh, traveling in that direction of Paddan Aram. That's the direction of obedience. And the Lord met him along the way. And he did that, like I said, in the form of a dream. Now, there are details. If we read the dream together, there are details in the dream that, that I think defy a clear explanation for even what they symbolize. I know many have attempted it, right? I, think of, I was just thinking about that song, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder, Soldiers of the Cross. I, I read the words of that song. I, think, I have no idea what that means. It's unknown authorship. It was compo composed and, and sung by African slaves in the face of their horrific oppression. But I think what it does is it kind of confuses both the facts and the purpose of Jacob's dream. So we don't really have an answer to the question, why is there a ladder or probably steps like a ziggurat or some sort of um, large stairway? Why, why is that leading up to heaven? And why are the angels ascending and de descending? And, and of course, Jacob observes this. He never climbs the stairs. He's not climbing the ladder. He's not climbing the stairs. And nor do we as we look at this. But the only thing I can conclude is that 
I think that the images in the dream are simply demonstrating that the Lord, because the Lord's standing above this, right? That the Lord is over all. And his messengers are at his beck and call to carry out his commands. And it's really a visual demonstration of his glory. He's in awe as a result of seeing this. But I take it that what's most important about this encounter is not so much what Jacob sees, though that has value, not minimizing that, but it's what he heard from the Lord. What he heard. The first thing he heard was the assurance of the covenant promise. See, Jacob is now making it his own. So the Lord intervenes. Uh, this is verse 13. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. So the covenant promise, he'd heard it from Isaac. He knew it went back to Abraham, and now the Lord is speaking it directly to him. And he says, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. That is exactly what he told, the Lord told Abraham. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Again, that is what the Lord told to Abraham, which was confirmed to Isaac. And now Jacob is receiving this same assurance of the covenant promise. And that assurance from the Lord would serve ultimately to strengthen his faith. He'd heard it from his father. Now he's hearing it again from the Lord. The next thing he receives as a result of this, this intervention is comfort. Comfort for whatever will happen to him. He knows, as God has assured him, that God will be with him. I am with you, the Lord says, and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And understand, as Jacob is heading out on this, this journey, he, before he hears from the Lord, He's only listening to his father. He doesn't know is he gonna, is, if he's going to have success in finding his wife, finding a wife. He didn't know how or if he would even prosper there. He didn't even know as he's leaving if he would ever see his father again before his father died. The Lord comforts him. I will be with you. I'm here. I'm going with you every step of the way. And I will ensure that I follow through with this promise. And as I've already mentioned, in terms of the imagery of it, Jacob had this sense of awe, because we see that from the text. The Lord there revealed his glory. And the very fact of that imagery, and also what he heard the Lord say to him personally. Verse 16, Jacob awoke from his sleep and, and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid. He said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. and This is the gate of heaven. And perhaps seeing the angels ascending and descending was, was what, what got him to see as like some sort of access point to heaven. I'll overstate that. But I take it that, that the Lord met Jacob in that dream to affirm him in the direction that he was going, to affirm him in the path of obedience to embracing the very promise of God and to comfort him in the face of potential uncertainty and just give a glimpse of his glory. As we think about our own lives as children of God, as followers of Jesus Christ today, it's possible, I suppose, that God has spoken to you in a dream. I've never had that direct kind of revelation. But you know what? I don't think we should be looking for that because we have the written word of God. We have the scriptures, right? That's what Peter says. Again, if you're ever tempted to think, oh, Lord, why don't you give me a dream? Why don't you give me a vision? Why don't you give me some special? Here's what Peter says. 2 Peter 3, I quote this. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, I quote this often. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then he says, how? Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And where do we get that knowledge? Verse 4. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Everything we need. Everything we need. Everything that we need that God requires of us. God has granted to 
us. Here's, here's the point I want to make. When you are walking in obedience to what God has already revealed, I want to assure you, you do not need an audible voice from heaven. You do not need special revelation in a dream or vision. You don't need a special customized prophecy. You just need to go back to the book, the scriptures, the Bible, the God-breathed written word. When the direction of your life is true faith in Christ, then God's word to you will be a source of assurance. It will be to you comfort and a glimpse into the very glory of God. Believe this. The Bible is infinitely better than a dream. Be confident of that every time you open it up. Infinitely better than a dream. And I'll say this, and I'm not denigrating Jacob's dream. He didn't have the book. (laughs) We have the book. He just had the word from Abraham. And Isaac. A dream is subjective. It's not not open to testing. And and you know this, I think you know this, that people have done horrible things because they think God told them to do something as a result of a dream or a vision. Alternatively, the Bible is, is an objective revelation and can be understood by all. And get this, the Bible is different from any other book. I, I hope you know this. You know when you pick up any kind of book or article to read, I'm saying other than the Bible. I I think you know the words are merely human words, right? They may be wise. They may be true and helpful, but they're not perfect. They're not perfect because the source is imperfect, right? And so when you read that book on history or, or, or manual on how to fix your Harley, right, what you're doing is your own mind is mediating that information to you. In effect, you're standing over top of that book. You're deciding its usefulness to you in the moment. We do that with every book, but with the Bible, it's different. When you read the Word of God, first we understand and hear the Word of God. First, we understand the words are perfect, right? Because the source is perfect. And second, and this is important, those words are mediated to your mind not by you. I'm not saying your mind's not involved. Those words are not mediated to you primarily by your mind, but by the Holy Spirit who indwells you. That's different. That is different. That's why in Hebrews 4.12, it says that the word uh, is living and active. Living and active. Because he's been breathed out by God. The Holy Spirit's breath, this word. And so, when you take it in, when you read it, when you hear it, the spirit in the life of a true believer, one who's embraced the promises of God, that word, the Holy Spirit takes, he puts it in you. And he brings the effect, accomplishing God's divine purposes. And so, so as, as the prophet Isaiah says, often quoted, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, an illustration of what the rain does, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Yeah, we get that. Makes sense. The Lord says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish. Not may. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. That's, that's what we have. So that word makes you wise to salvation in Christ. That word awakens you from the dead. That word will teach, it will reprove, it will correct you, it will train you in righteousness, it will equip you for every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. That word is good news, it is the very power of God to count you righteous in God's sight, Romans 1, 16 and 17, and to conform you to the image of Christ, Romans 8, 29. That's the word. But I'll say this too, when you're not, when you're not on a path of obedience, The Bible is an offense to you. It will annoy you. It will grate on you. Praise God that it does, right? You're rebelling. The Word of God, you're just going to want to close it and set it aside until you come into humble submission to it. 
It's going to torture you. I pray that it would. Now, for those who've utterly rejected Christ, the Bible then evokes this, even a seething hatred, or, or maybe just a disdain. But perhaps you heard in the news, a pastor in Finland, he's facing up to two years in prison for hate speech. And that charge on him stems from a work he published, which, which effectively shows what the Bible says about marriage and sexuality. He's run against the culture. And so they're threatening that pastor with prison. As a Lutheran pastor... There's still some faithful Lutherans who haven't abandoned. I mean, we know in this nation that the Lutheran Church in America, ELCA, they've embraced the homosexual unions. But this pastor standing on the Word of God. Well, if you're unsure about what is righteous and good and pure, listen, run to the Word of God. He'll give you what you need. When you're fearful of the future, go to the Word and listen, when you want to see something amazing and encounter the very glory of God, you're going to find it in the Word. So soak in the Word. Read, hear, study, meditate, ruminate, recite, and delight in the Word of God. And make it a priority of being with others who do the same. That's why we're here this morning. The psalmist says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Not that person. But the one who's blessed, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. We don't need a dream. We have the book. But we need the same message that Jacob received, which assured him of his faith, comforted him that God would be there, and gave a glimpse of the glory of God. The last word I have here is decision. Decision. You know what this is like when you have your first child. It's a radical, radical life change. And I, I know, couples have done this. I've heard stories. They, you know, they bring baby home, and they look at each other and go, what have we done, right? You've got this little human to take care of. And now this is rushing in on you. There's so many decisions that you have to make that you never made before. So many things that you used to do, you, you don't do, and you won't do for a long time. You simply cannot live your life in the same way that you used to. Your work, your social life, your vacation plans, how you travel, what kind of house or apartment, you simply cannot carry on as if nothing has happened. And you're going to make a host of very important decisions. Now that's obvious to all of us, isn't it? This happens with any sort of life-encountering, life-changing life encounter. And how much more a life-changing encounter with a living God. Jacob received assurance of that promise, remember? He received comfort for the unknown, and he was overcome with awe at having encountered God. His life would never be the same again. So what now? You see, Jacob made decisions. He made decisions to do things. Three important ones, I see at least. First, he decided to mark the event. He wanted that location to be a constant reminder, not only for him, but for the generations that would follow, that the Lord met him there. You see what happened. He took that stone that was his pillow, and he set it up as a pillar. He anointed that stone with oil. And that anointing of oil is just like a, a ritual of sanctification. This is special. Now, that word pillar, it's uh, not just, it, it's full of more meaning. It's not just something that stands there, but it's actually a Hebrew word. Matzvah means a monument or a, or a personal memorial. He's a pillar. And what he did was he marked that event by naming the place Bethel. That means house of God, Bethel. House, Beth, El, God. And that place became a significant location for worship, for future generations of Israelites. So it actually happened that way. At the Lord's command, Jacob would return there and make an altar of sacrifice. Later on, in the conquest of the, the promised land under Joshua, Bethel, that place, was under Canaanite control. It became a priority to capture it. And after, you can just read through your Old Testament, after Israel controlled Bethel, 
It was the place where the Israelites would gather and inquire of the Lord. They would gather there and fast and weep before the Lord. They would inquire of the Lord at Bethel. And Shiloh was a place that was just north of Bethel. It became the the semi-permanent location for the tabernacle, the tabernacle that the Lord commanded Moses to construct in the wilderness. When they'd settled in the land, Shiloh, just north of Bethel, was the place where that was situated. And it was so important as as a... as a place in Israelite history by that point, that that they even used the location for unrighteous means after Solomon's death and the division of Israel into two nations, Israel to north and Judah to the south. Wicked kings in the north chose Bethel as the site to build an altar supposedly to the Lord, but using calves as the means by which to offer worship, idolatry, wickedness. So that became significant in the life of Israel. That was Jacob's decision. Mark the occasion. Mark the place. The second important decision, Jacob made a vow. And what he did in that vow was he effectively claimed the promise for himself. Look at what it says. If God be with me, and will keep me in this way that I will go, and will give me the bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I came again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. Of course, that did came, come to be. And all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Now, this vow, I, I just want you to note that he's simply echoing back to the Lord what had already been promised to him. And in fact, what he is saying, if the Lord does as he has said he will do, then he is truly God. And of course, the Lord will do what he says he will do. And he indeed is truly God. Jacob's recognizing that. Promise is true. And Jacob's other decision, third decision, I think, was effectively pledge his service to the Lord. Now, he talks about giving a tenth, a tithe of all that he has. I think it's unclear to me how he would do that. To whom he would give it, not sure. But I think the point to be made here is that he recognizes that whatever he receives is going to come from the hand of the Lord and whatever he has is to be used in service of the Lord. And the tithe was a way of saying that the Lord's promise, that the Lord's promise was more important than anything else in his life. He took a direction. He received revelation from the Lord assuring him. And now he made decisions about what, would he, what the future would be, what he was going to do going forward. Now, if God has visited you, if God has revealed his son, the Christ, to you as crucified and raised to life, and if you have believed that he did that so that your sins might be forgiven, so that you might be free from the power of sin, so that you know that as a result of what Jesus has done, that you now have a share in the the eternal inheritance of Jesus, then that confidence, embracing that promise, will truly compel you to make some very important decisions in your life going forward. I believe it will. If you have believed, you will want to mark the event. Now, how do we do that as Christians? How do we mark the event if you have believed? Well, well, Jesus gave some very basic ways. Jesus said, make disciples, baptizing them. If you've put your trust in the promises of God in Christ, then you are going to want to, if you have not done so already, you're going to want to follow him in obedience by being baptized, identifying with Jesus in his death, for your sins, and his resurrection for your life. You're also going to mark the event like we will in a few moments as we gather around the Lord's table, where Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And we do this here in public because other people in the room are going to see you take this bread and eat it acknowledging that you belong to Christ. Other people are in the room are going to see you drink the cup. Jesus said, the cup is a new covenant in my blood. You're acknowledging to your brothers and sisters in the room, 
My sins were covered at the cross. That's my life. And then you're going to claim the promise. So you mark the event. Then you'll claim the promise. You'll claim the promise by, by living each day in light of the gospel promise, right? Keeping the gospel in front of you always. Delighting to hear it, delighting to tell it, knowing that apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God sent his son to the earth to die for your sins and was raised for life and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Apart from that reality, we really don't have any reason to be or exist. We, 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 our function in the world is just pointless. You claim the promise by, by keeping it front and center. And you gather with others who love that promise. And they say, preach into the choir, you're here. You're here, I trust, because you love the promise of God in Christ. You love the gospel. And you're going to serve. Maybe tithe, yes, but you're going to serve. All of your life will now be oriented towards this promise. The decisions you make. What am I doing tomorrow? No longer serving self, but figuring out how to serve the ones that the Lord has put in our lives for the sake of bringing glory to Jesus. That's the all-in life of a disciple. So let me ask, are you all in? Does it show in the decisions that you've made with your life? Now, we're not saved primarily by decisions, but if you have been welcomed into the family of God by God's sovereign grace, you're going to make decisions in keeping with that reality. And so Jesus, when he said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The decision that we make every day, brothers and sisters, is denying self, following Jesus. And let me say this, if you're not all in for Jesus, you're not in at all. worth examining yourself. Well, with the promised land before them, now we're stepping back from this story and seeing where it fits in the context of the Israelite nation. There they are on the precipice of taking the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob under Joshua's leadership, about to cross. The physical land was before them and their own Fathers, the, the immediate generation before them had failed to enter it. But God's promise, what they needed to understand and what we need to understand, God's promise was always more than about a plot of land. The promise of God was always for eternal fellowship with him that could only ever be attained by faith. So here is the warning that the writer of Hebrews gives. While the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. And so, this is for us. Are you trusting the promise of God in Christ? Have you embraced the promise of God in Christ? Or are you standing on the outside like Esau, looking to negotiate your way in? Oh, don't be like Esau. If there's any way to be like Jacob, you're not going to imitate his sins, but simply embrace the promise of God in Christ. And it will change your life, it changes the direction of your life. It changes your approach to the way God reveals himself through the word. And you're going to make decisions in keeping with those promises. I trust. I trust that we are likewise together walking this journey, encouraging each other to hold on to the promise, embrace the promise of God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, you have uh, granted to us these very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in your divine nature. And so, Lord, as we have ruminated on your word today, I pray 
that we are, that for those of us following and, and delighting in what you have already accomplished, that we are, that we are encouraged. That for those who are dabbling with unbelief and, and just playing at the fringes, God, I pray you use this occasion to awaken faith, cause that one to embrace your promise truly. Father, you have given us uh, forgiveness in your Son. And we are commanded to remember that sacrifice as we share around the table of the Lord Jesus. So by your Spirit, Father, we pray, continue with us and use this time to strengthen our faith for the glory of Jesus. Amen.